in other words, to give uh, more identity to this uh, growing field that is uh, neonatal neurology. Uh, and so if you happy to come and uh, to speak about the grand round of philosophy we have, uh, and after uh, I, I can introduce uh, Professor Stephen Miller in the meanwhile, the room is getting uh, more crowded. So let me, let me first say hello okay. and welcome hello. to Genoa, to Professor Miller. We are very happy and honored to have you here. Um, this, Thank you. Stay sit. Don't need to. <laughs> I, I prefer to stand so they they see me better, you know. But uh, so what can I say? It's, uh, I'm really impressed about the number of uh, participants uh, who are connected online to this uh, webinar events. I know, I know, I know. So it's, I wish to congratulate uh, Luca for this important initiative, which uh, which uh, brought the Gaslini Institute, the Gaslini community, in in many parts of the world. I've seen several countries that are quite far from Italy, including Ethiopia, if you, you mentioned, Latria and many others. So it's uh, Indonesia, maybe, also. And so it's, uh, it's an important initiative. Luca told me that it's a kind of experiment, but if it is an experiment, it's a, it was a success. And I think it's worth being, uh, let's say, replied in the next future with another, another event. <laughs> So it's uh, regarding Luca asked me to, so he will introduce you, I, I want, because of course he knows you much better than I. Uh, happy to know you today anyway. Uh, so what can I say? So it's uh, you, you uh, uh, been invited specifically to give this grand round to the uh, Gaslini community. We have started this, uh, uh, this uh, conferences this uh, earlier this year because we want to raise the cultural level of the institute in uh, and the scientific level of the institute in the in several pediatric fields as you know Gaslini is a, a, a kind of pediatric polyclinic so it's uh, it hosts all the main uh, pediatric specialties uh, either in the medical field or in the surgical field so we we and also we we have a several well-equipped and very active uh, research labs which produce research in several fields so it's uh, so with your help and the other speakers that we have been have invited and are inviting in the, in the next month we want to let's say to in some way put gaslini in a uh, in a, in a in an international environment and uh, as i said raise the culture and uh, let's say, supports our young clinicians and scientists in particular, and uh, to foster their, their um, activities in, uh, in, in research and in, clinical, uh, in the clinical practice. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'm here, happy to listen at your lecture. Thank you. Luca, maybe we, can, we should wait for a, a couple of minutes, yeah, because, minutes to because you know, it's... The, the the room is quite full already, but maybe can wait maybe two three more minutes. Yeah, we, in Italy we are used to wait for the fifteen academic time. We we say that way, but for these seminars we have coined a new time frame, which is ten minute guys leaning time before starting the conversation to give people time to get to the main uh, auditorium, which is ancient enough as you have seen. So you, you are from Toronto, see kids? No, no from Vancouver. Vancouver. Now. Vancouver. Ah, Vancouver. Vancouver. Now Vancouver. Okay. Ah. For, for what I remember, no. I, uh, I've been I've... to Vancouver once, but I, many more times in Toronto. See kids. I have many friends there. Yesterday, the steel was like. In the rheumatology. Uh, yeah. Yes. I've been once to Vancouver. Yeah. That's a bit far from here, but very beautiful. Very beautiful city. Okay, I can introduce him. Uh, just wait a few more minutes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not a matter of uh, more people, but the quality of people who are sitting. That's my opinion. And all still connected. Uh, and uh, my pleasure is about uh, having such a young uh, because he is young, <laughs> researcher, so productive, uh, so uh, 
concrete and so really successful over the last year. So I think we know one each other since 20 years, something like that. We met in San Francisco uh, the first time at the Pediatric Academic Society's meeting. I'm speaking about 2002, so more than 20. And he was a uh, an outstanding uh, young researcher. Uh, you, I mean, the cardiologists and cardiosurgeons probably will remember uh, very well uh, Stephen Miller because he was the first one uh, to highlight the potential problems of the brain of babies born with cardiac congenital disease uh, and having a delay uh, in the maturation because before that time, we mainly knew that uh, the brain of these babies were exposed to more risks, but uh, wasn't so differently grown compared to the others. After that time, uh, uh, he produced many other papers. I, I want to really uh, be able to, to count all of them, especially for the way they changed our attitude. I'd like to mention as well, the attention to the effect of stress and pain. I, I like the word pain uh, during uh, the neonatal age on the, our premature babies. I won't forget the feeling uh, when you did show that babies with an arterial umbilical line compared to those babies without uh, undergoing a lot of ill pricks in the first three days of life were differently affected in the brain structures as well. And so uh, it's a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Miller here, uh, that is uh, uh, speaking about brain health in the preterm newborn from connectome to home. This is a major point. Uh, we, we say thank you to many colleagues coming to listen to this talk from uh, outside the hospital. And thank you so much to everyone. And uh, he's chief of pediatric medicine in the BC Hosp uh, Children's that, Hospital. Children's Hospital now in Vancouver. If I remember well, you were trained in Montreal after you went to Vancouver. No, San Francisco. San Francisco directly. So San Francisco, where we met, and you stayed seven or eight years, something like that. More? No. Six years. San Six. Francisco. Okay, fine. And after you moved back to Vancouver, from Vancouver, went to uh six kids in toronto and back to vancouver is it right that's right can i tell you the rules in canada how they run it about being a chief somewhere so I, i'm not sure to tell uh, the uh direttore generale but in canada after 10 years you have to change the chief uh and uh, this is uh, probably something that is protecting uh, us uh, on is not was a problem i'm waiting uh for sitting or not so now five seven minutes are passed from the time so we can uh, we can start and uh, that's my pleasure uh stephen miller steve thank, thank you, you so much you got the microphone so thank you so much luca for the really kind and warm introduction. I especially want to thank you for the warm welcome to Gaslini and to Genoa. I want to thank all of the professors that have made time in their busy days over the last couple of days to speak about science. It really is such important work and inspiring work that's happening here. But even more than those meetings, uh, the real inspiration for me over the last few days were meeting so many of the early career researchers and the trainees on this site really pushing innovative work around the newborn brain and forcing us all to think differently about where our field is heading. So for those of you in the room not invested in the baby brain, let me just say my biased opinion and the real disclosure is that I think now is the most amazing time in medical sciences to invest your energies on the developing brain. For those of you that were able to attend uh, the the session and the symposium today. I mean, look at the breadth of approaches we now have to understanding the newborn brain from outstanding imaging, giving us a window on brain development, all the way through the gut microbiome and how that's influencing neurobehavior decades later. 
So after the conversations that we had yesterday and hearing some of the research that was happening, I actually went back to some old slides to reframe the conversation that I want to have with you this evening about brain health and the preterm newborn. And I want to leave us with this idea that we need to move across our disciplines and really embrace the breadth of science that's going to be required to improve the health of the brain of preterm babies. And that's why we'll go from the connectome to the home. Unfortunately, I still have no real financial disclosures. So given the history at Gaslini, I thought it was an opportune time to reflect on the history of neonatal neurology from when I started in this. And I started as a medical student in Montreal in the 1990s, in the mid 1990s. And when I first expressed an interest in doing newborn neurology, people that I worked with weren't very happy with that idea. Uh, and they weren't so happy because they said that the baby brain is plastic. How many people have heard that expression? We heard a lot about very specific neuroplasticity today, but I'm seeing a lot of nods. Right? The baby brain is plastic. And so why would you invest a career on a brain that could recover so easily? That seemed completely at odds with needing to wait one year to see a child neurologist because you had cerebral palsy. If the baby brain was so plastic, why were our neurology clinics so full of children needing care? So as we moved through the 90s and recognized that the baby brain was actually vulnerable to injury, whether directly from hypoxia ischemia or indirectly from neonatal seizures, we became much more attuned to what was happening in adult neurology. And so for uh, those of you my generation or older, you'll recall that in the 2000s, we moved into an era of acute neuroprotection. This was the time that stroke in adults was becoming a treatable disease with thrombolysis. But you had to intervene within a number of hours. But if you didn't come to the emergency room in time for your thrombolysis, then there wasn't more that one could do. So in the neonatal field, we thought about the newborn brain being injured as a single injury and then a fixed outcome. Because of that, we focused our attention on acute neuroprotection. We heard Pierre reference this just a few minutes ago, that you had to keep the neuron from dying. We also wanted to make connections. And as the 2000s evolved and we saw the introduction of therapeutic hypothermia and the effectiveness of acute intervention, we started then to ask, what about brain repair? Not only do we want the neurons, but we want them to be functional. If there is an injury, we want capacity to promote repair. And that allowed us in the 2010s to shift our attention towards this trajectory of brain health and I think you saw that embedded in all of the conversation over this afternoon, that it is really about how the brain is maturing in the neonatal period and beyond. And what's been most exciting to me in the last few years has been this focus on the importance of the everyday experience of babies. We've seen about pain, nutrition, beautiful talk on sleep, and so we've now started to appreciate that it's not just the big events, the catastrophic hypoxia ischemia that's important for the preterm baby. It's the everyday experience of these babies that is fundamental to brain health. And this is the story I wanna share. It's Grand Rounds. And in Canada, we always start Grand Rounds with a patient. So I'm just gonna show this patient to remind us that we're talking about a baby who was born early, small and sick. Despite the amazing advances in neonatal intensive care, brain injury in this baby remains unacceptably prevalent. Pierre showed some highlight photos of white matter injury. These are these punctate lesions best seen on T1 weighted MRI. So here we have an axial image. We can make out this beautiful thin cerebral cortex, billions of neurons. The white matter, which is the connections of 
the cortex going to the subcortical nuclei and the thalamus. And it should look dark gray, but you could see in this baby, you have all of these punctate bright spots, these focal areas of necrosis. You could see it on the sagittal image. And just as we heard in the prior talk, we think that this is an extension, a milder spectrum of periventricular leukomalacia or PVL, right in the periventricular white matter. Still one third of babies born 24 to 32 weeks gestation acquire this injury. It is best seen on MRI scans done early in life. If you just do an MRI scan when the baby is full term, these lesions have faded and they're very hard to detect. There are some centers, Don Gano at UCSF has reported some decline in the, in the incidence of white matter injury, but if you still look across contemporary neonatal cohorts scanned early in life with MRI, 25 to 33% of these babies will acquire injury. And the injury has multiple dimensions. So we've heard earlier, cystic periventricular leukomalacia, the most severe form of the injury, punctate white matter injury, and this is just what lives above the surface of the water. The iceberg below the water is the diffuse white matter injury, the lesion that Pierre Grissant just gave us a very elegant discussion of, and I'm gonna come back to. So Luca referenced this study, it was a study done with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Shannon Hamrick, an neonatologist uh, now at Emory, where when we were in UCSF and I had gone there to do a fellowship, and on metabolic brain development in babies with periventricular leukomalacia. I was working with Dan Vigneron, an MR scientist doing MR spectroscopy, a window on brain metabolism of the baby, Jim Barkovich, a neuroradiologist, and Donna Ferrero, a neonatal neurologist. And after a year of scanning babies early in life and again at term equivalent age, I was panicked because we didn't have a single baby with PVL. I thought the grant was going to cut my funding and send me back to Montreal. Unfortunately, we worked very closely with the radiologists at the time who for many years had been doing ultrasound the same way for decades. The only thing that had changed was the probes got better and better. So you would think with better imaging, you should find more PVL. So working with Shannon and David Glidden, our mentor in biostatistics, we saw instead that there was this very dramatic decrease in the incidence of periventricular leukomalacia. It went from 2% to 0.2%, a tenfold reduction in the most severe form of brain injury in the preterm baby. Working with the epidemiologist, we saw that the single best predictor of this dramatic decline was a more gentle use of mechanical ventilation, preventing hypocarbia and doing a little less and being more gentle in the care of these babies. Two things were particularly striking about this study. The first was that I was doing brain imaging as part of Donna Ferrero's Neonatal Brain Disorder Center, which really was focused on molecular neuroscience and identifying cellular targets in the lab. There was very little being experimented on in the lab that could account for a tenfold reduction in injury. So the other part of this story or interpretation of these data is that we already have the tools in our hands at the time. If we understand how to provide newborn intensive care in an optimal way, can we decrease brain injury another tenfold? Linda DeVries and her colleagues in Utrecht showed very elegantly a very similar decline in the most severe form of white matter injury in the preterm baby, PVL. And they took it a step further to show that that is what predicted this decrease in cerebral palsy that we heard of earlier. That's the good news. The bad news comes back to this punctate white matter injury, these focal areas of necrosis scattered throughout the white matter. And I show these three different babies, again, all axial images to show this baby with a single spot, this baby with more confluent spots, and this baby with very severe injury, including some cysts, you might even call this periventricular leukomalacia. Again, these punctate lesions are virtually, they're very difficult to see with ultrasound unless you do it serially and carefully. And I look to Linda DeVries and her colleagues in Utrecht on uh, how that's done. And much harder to see as these babies get to term equivalent age. 
So we've been challenged with this idea because there is still plasticity of the neonatal brain. How do these lesions matter? Working with Jesse Guo, now a senior research associate in my team, which is now split between Vancouver and Toronto, and Van Chow, a neonatal neurologist who has really focused our attention on the clinical condition of these babies and how the imaging matters for their long term. Jesse mapped out all of the lesions that we identified in a group of 216 very preterm babies. These were babies scanned in Vancouver, 24 to 32 weeks gestation. It's a reminder that the peak incidence of white matter injury is 28 weeks. So when you speak to Professor Romenke and you talk about intraventricular hemorrhage, that's a disease of the extreme preterm baby. White matter injury is the disease of the preterm period, a peak of 28 weeks and then a bell curve across that peak. So we map out all of these lesions, warmer colors, when we put them all on a common template, tell us that lesions are more likely to occur in that area. So you could see that lesions all occur in the periventricular white matter, or mostly, and they're predominantly central lesions to the anterior posterior gradient that Luca referred to. But as a neurologist, we wanna know what happens to these babies. So we were able to convert these maps into odds ratio maps. So for any given pixel in the MR image, if it was affected by white matter injury, what is the odds of having an adverse outcome? Motor outcomes or cognitive outcomes defined at 18 months by a score less than 85 on the Bailey scales of infant development three. So not a very severe impairment. What do we see is that white matter injury strongly predicts motor outcomes predicts motor outcomes better than cognitive outcomes, the colors are warmer, but it's the anterior lesions that are most important. It's those lesions towards the front of the brain that are most predictive of outcome. So the most common lesions are central. They go central, then posterior, and then anterior. But the lesions that are most predictive of outcome are anterior. So not all punctate white matter lesions will be expected to lead to neurodevelopmental impairment. So location matters. And I see some neurologists in the room, and that's what we're taught through our adult neurology training. Uh, location matters. Dalit K.M. Rand, now a neonatal neurologist at Charizetic Hospital in Jerusalem, uh, was involved in these imaging studies, but she said, well, I'm a neurologist. When I go back to the NICU, I want to know what to, can what to tell families. I don't have Jesse to do the physics with me. So she took a very simple approach, and she said, if it's the anterior lesions that matter, I'm going to take the ventricles. I'm going to cut them in half by a line. And if the lesions are in front of the line, they're anterior, I'm going to predict that those are the lesions that matter more. And sure enough, the location of the white matter lesions is more strongly associated with outcome than the quantitative volume of lesions. You add a little bit if you can consider the clinical condition of the baby, whether they have retinopathy of prematurity or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, but the bulk of the predictive value of punctate white matter injury lies in their location. So let's come back to what we heard from Professor Grissant in Paris and ask the question, why is the white matter so incredibly vulnerable? I mean, how many of you look after a population of children that if you write a request for an MRI scan, one third of them are gonna be abnormal? There aren't many hands up. So there are many reasons why the neonatal brain is so vulnerable in the third trimester of gestation to injury. A major part of the story is a credit to Stephen Back, a professor of neuroscience and neurology at OHSU in Portland, where first working with Joe Volpe and then in his lab, he defined the selective vulnerability of the pre-oligodendrocyte. That cell within the lineage, as you go from stem cell to myelinating oligodendrocyte, it's this pre-oligodendrocyte that is exquisitely vulnerable to energy deprivation, hypoxia, ischemia, or glucose deprivation. So why is the white matter so incredibly vulnerable to injury? Well, the cells that live in the white matter in the third trimester of gestation are the ones that are incredibly vulnerable to injury. If you look at pathology at the brain at 20 weeks gestation, the white matter is axons and tons of pre-oligodendrocytes, the vulnerable cell type. As the babies mature towards term age, the pre-oligodendrocytes become these immature oligos, beautiful cells that start to wrap around axons even before they put down the fat of myelin 
And these cells are very hard to kill. So we have white matter injury in the preterm baby. We have neuronal injury in the term baby because their oligos are now in this resistant phenotype. And that, as we heard earlier, used to be the story, but it's now much more complex and I think much more hopeful. So if we take the trigger of hypoxia ischemia, and uh, we have to think about inflammation as well, I'm gonna keep towards hypoxia ischemia. We have some areas of punctate necrosis, those areas of T1 hyperintensity or cis, where we lose all of the cellular elements, the tissue is dead. But surrounding those areas of punctate white matter injury are these very vast areas of myelin pallor. And the myelin's not growing because we have selective pre oligo death, they're vulnerable, but they regenerate. So we now have this pool of pre oligodendrocytes. And because of a reactive gliosis, they fail to mature. And so you get this maturation arrest. And that is why this diffuse white matter injury is so problematic as these children will grow over time. One of the most important studies I think published in the last decade, again, comes from Stephen Back's lab, where they show that hyaluronidase inhibitors promote pre oligodendrocyte maturation in vitro in chronic white matter injury. So we have this maturation arrest that is mediated by the extracellular matrix, by hyaluronic acid and toll-like receptor four. So an interplay between hypoxia, ischemia and inflammation. And using a pharmacologic agent that can now be um, undone so that you go in these treated animals to allow the pre oligodendrocytes to overcome the maturation arrest and start to myelinate. This is just a reminder that while I'm gonna focus on white matter injury because of the time that we have today, it's not to ignore intraventricular hemorrhage. We saw this study in, earlier in the symposium today, beautiful work by the Gaslini team, uh, showing the influence of isolated and low-grade intracranial hemorrhage, either intraventricular hemorrhage and cerebellar hemorrhage as being important. And now I think we have an incredible opportunity to understand why that is so that we could ultimately identify ways to overcome that maturation and promote more optimal outcomes. So we started with this idea that the, we had a preterm brain, the white matter was filled with pre oligodendrocytes and those oligodendrocytes were vulnerable. We now understand that it's not so much about those punctate white matter lesions. On pathology, those lesions account for less than a third of the total burden of white matter injury. The vast majority of white matter injury in the preterm baby is this diffuse white matter injury that is characterized by a maturation arrest. So this is not a single injury with fixed consequence. It is about the trajectory of brain development. We've seen different ways that this has been shown over the day. I'm just gonna show you a different image. This is now an axial T2 weighted image. You can make out the cerebral cortex it's this bright, it's this dark ribbon, excuse me, where the laser pointer is. It's about a millimeter thick. It overlies the white matter, which is bright. We have the basal ganglia and the thalamus, the brain's relay station. This is a scan done at 30 weeks. The numbers I just noticed are cut off at the bottom. And the same baby brought back to the scanner nine weeks later. So what happens? These billions of neurons in the cerebral cortex now make trillions of connections. Where I live in British Columbia, you can get outside the city and on a clear summer day, see the Milky Way. That's like the number of neurons that we're seeing in the brain, making even more connections. To make room for those connections, you get sulcation and gyration of the cerebral cortex. And look how the brain is transformed. In three dimensions, this brain now looks like our brains. It's just smaller. What's so remarkable as a clinician about this incredible change, this transformation of the brain over just nine weeks is that this baby spent six of those nine weeks undergoing neonatal intensive care. So if we need to focus on trajectory, let's ask how our therapies are influencing this. And the only way we can ask that question is by having tools that allow us to quantify brain development. This is 
an amazing image from uh, Serena Council and her team at the Center for the Developing Brain and the Developing Human Connectome Project. This is diffusion tensor imaging, it's Hardy imaging, where we're looking at fractional anisotropy, a measure of the organization of the brain. So as the brain, the white matter of the brain matures and you start to trap protons within axons because the oligodendrocytes are wrapping around the axons and keeping the protons in the axons, fractional anisotropy, a measure of directionality will now go up. You can color code how this water is diffusing along the axons. Green is front to back in the brain. Blue is up and down. So you can make out, if I make this spin again, the corticospinal tracts going from the precentral sulcus all the way down into the spinal cord. Right to left in the brain is the corpus callosum. So as it spins around, you'll get to see the connections of the right and left hemisphere. So the trajectory of how the connectome is developing these babies and how it might be influenced by injury can now be assessed quantitatively using advanced brain imaging like diffusion tensor imaging. This is a slide of data that was just presented at the Child Neurology Society meeting in Vancouver a few months ago by uh, Dr. Thivia Selvanathan. Thivia was a neonatal neurology fellow and PhD student with me at SickKids. She started this week as a, an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. And working with the MR science team, she was able to develop maps of the disconnectome knowing the work of intraventricular hemorrhage from here and others, we weren't limited to white matter injury. We also mapped out on a quantitative template where periventricular hemorrhagic infarction was happening in this cohort. And by using these quantitative maps overlaid on the human connectome data, we were able to ask, how was the brain disconnected by these focal lesions? And look how widespread the disconnections are with periventricular hemorrhagic infarction involving the basal ganglia, the brain's relay stations. And then let's come back to this image of punctate white matter injury, where you could see some posterior lesions, some anterior lesions, but look how widespread the brain disconnections are just based on these punctate little white matter lesions. I, I think it's time we rename this disease as it's not really punctate white matter injury. It's a disease of the white matter. We just see it as punctate because that's what's most visible on conventional MRI. Thivia also gave us the first clue of why these anterior lesions are so important. Look at the difference in the disconnectome when you have anterior lesions versus posterior lesions. So we have to think about the trajectory of brain development and more specifically the trajectory of the development of our connectome. So now let's come back to the importance of the everyday experience of these babies. And given our time, I'm gonna focus very specifically on pain, sedation, and nutrition. When I moved from San Francisco to Vancouver uh, the first time, I was very lucky to have a neighbor, Ruth Grunau, a developmental psychologist who had dedicated her career to understanding the impact of pain and pain-related stress on the developing brain and the preterm baby. And over a series of experiments, in clinical experiments, what Ruth had shown is that the greater the exposure to pain, and she operationalized that as the greater the number of skin breaking procedures. It's very hard to know what a baby is feeling because they can't tell us. So we just counted the number of pokes a baby had. And what Ruth had seen is that the greater the number of pokes a baby had, the worse their cognitive outcomes and the more they're internalizing behaviors like anxiety, even when you accounted for how sick the babies were. Now, as a neurologist, and I see some neurologists in the room, so thank you for being here. If there's something different about your cognition, there has to be something different about your brain. So we sought to set out to ask, how does the experience of neonatal pain influence this impressive trajectory of brain development? We started by using uh, fractional anisotropy, and this was in the first 86 babies that we had scanned serially in Vancouver. And we could see when we look at fractional anisotropy, this measure of directionality. For the experimentalists, an increase in fractional anisotropy maps beautifully to the maturation of the oligodendrocyte lineage. As oligos become moved from pre-oligos to immature oligos to mature oligos and lay down myelin, fractional anisotropy goes up. 
So what you see is that over time, fractional anisotropy is going up highest in the children with low skin breaking procedures. So let me pause here to say, how did we define low skin breaking procedures? Is we took the median number of pokes. In this cohort, it was just over 100. So that's like every time someone finished a, a talk today, we invited people to come for a blood test. And then we kept going day after day. So some babies, hundreds of painful experiences. The epidemiologists who are with us now will say, but you're giving the babies pokes because they're sicker. No one's poking babies for fun. They get pain because it's required for their life-saving care. So we then modeled multiple aspects of neonatal illness severity. And we continue to see that skin breaking procedures predicts lower pain. We still didn't believe this. And the epidemiologist said, you must have forgotten to adjust for something. And it was only when we really teased apart the diffusion tensor imaging data that we became confident that this was a real finding because the pain was associated with changes in diffusion along the long axis of the axon. Days on a ventilator, infection, all of the other parts of critical illness were all associated with a different component of diffusion, the component of diffusion perpendicular to the axon, like the glial component. It all becomes lower fractional anisotropy, but driven by a very different change on diffusion tensor imaging. Over the last two days, we've had multiple talks about the importance of mentorship, and I've always relied on my mentors to ask the very hard questions. And it was Donna Ferrero, after presenting these data at the Pediatric Academic Societies, who said, look, this is all sounds convincing, maybe, but there's neurophysiology evidence that shows that preterm babies don't gate pain normally through the thalamus. This is work from Rebecca Slater, Mariah Fitzgerald, and their colleagues in England. And so if the thalamus is the sensory relay station of the brain and localization matters, then I'll believe the pain story if there is a change in the thalamus. So credit to Jesse Guo working with Malar Chakravarti and our other colleagues in imaging science and Emma Dorden, now a Canada research chair at the University of Western Ontario, they refined how we could measure the growth of the thalamus in these preterm babies. And using deformation tensor morphometry, we were able to see that there was a shape change in the thalamus. We don't have the resolution at this age to identify the specific subnuclei of the thalamus. So we relied on the shape change of the thalamus and we could see that pain predicts smaller thalamus, particularly painful experiences that are early in life. And that decrease in thalamic volume was driven where we would expect sensory motor thalamus to be. We convinced Donna. So this association of pain, smaller thalamus, also persists when you account for all of the other aspects of illness severity. And I'm just going to highlight that this association is strongest in the youngest babies in those 24 to 20 weeks gestation, particularly when their pokes are happening early in life. Now, I trained at a time where people weren't sure that babies felt pain. Thankfully, now we recognize analgesia and sedation as a critical component of contemporary neonatal intensive care. I've moved much more times than I had ever imagined I would. And one of the advantages of these moves have been appreciating different aspects, different approaches to clinical care at different centers. So I came from a center that used midazolam for very effective um, sedation on babies for babies who are on a ventilator for prolonged periods of time. I don't know if you use midazolam here. No. So I moved to sick kids where there was a ban on midazolam. No midazolam in babies uh, who were preterm. I wondered why. So we went back to the neuroscience literature. And around the time of this move to Toronto, there was an emerging neuroscience literature to show that midazolam was toxic to the large neurons of the hippocampus. So. Jesse again, and this was work um, done collaboratively with Malar Chakravarti, uh, professor of imaging science now at McGill. We mapped out the development of the hippocampus, a and, and very small structure in the preterm baby. And Emma Dorden then worked with this hippocampal growth over time from early in life, median of 32 weeks postmenstrual age to term equivalent age, 
and saw that the hippocampus was growing much more slowly in those babies exposed to midazolam. Around this time as well, there was evidence to say that morphine was toxic to the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. Emily Tam and Jill Zwicker, using this cohort of babies in Vancouver, showed that the higher the dose of morphine, the slower the growth of the cerebellum, even when you accounted for how much pain the babies had and how sick they had. Now, pain wasn't predicting the hippocampus. Midazolam wasn't predicting the cerebellum. And morphine wasn't predicting the hippocampus, just the cerebellum. And so as we think about our statistical model and getting more sophisticated, it's also important to recognize the relative selective vulnerability of brain structures and use that to enhance causal inference as well. Well, the nursery in Toronto didn't use midazolam, they did use sucrose. And I know you use a lot of sucrose here, so these are data from Julianne Schneider. She came to do a fellowship with us in Toronto and uh, came from Lausanne, a NICU that used uh, very little morphine, no midazolam. They couldn't access sucrose, so they used glucose for procedural analgesia. And what did we see is that the higher the dose of glucose you had, the slower the growth of the brain, particularly in girls. We just heard from Pierre that boys in the NICU tend to be the more vulnerable to anything. This was the first time that we were seeing female vulnerability, particularly to sucrose, or to glucose. And it mattered in regards to the performance development index, the motor function that was tested in their cohort on the Bailey scales. This was a group of 51 babies scanned three times in the NICU period, and then almost all of them seen in follow-up. So uh, methodologically uh, very sound. So we land on a model when we think about pain, analgesia, and sedation, where pain is particularly vulnerable to the thalamus. And if we look carefully, temporarily, the white matter changes follow what happens in the thalamus. Midazolam to the hippocampus, morphine to the cerebellum, and glucose to the basal ganglia. So what's one to do? It's good to have friends that also come visit and ask you hard questions. So this is uh, Linda DeVries from Utrecht. When she came uh, to the NICU, she noticed that in North America, we like to take out our central lines very quickly because we want to prevent line infections. In Utrecht, they were happy to tolerate a higher risk of infections if keeping the line in meant that they could just do the blood draws without poking the babies. So if we look at thalamus relative to total cerebral volume, so this is the percent of the brain that's the thalamus relative to the number of invasive procedures. And notice that uh, in Canada, we're going still up into the hundreds. We see in Utrecht much less pain and much better brain. And this is associated with outcomes as well. I'd love to be able to do a clinical trial in this area, but it seems so far our experience is that it's unfundable. And so I'm hoping to continue to leverage the postal code lottery so that we could look at practice variability across sites. And that's our ongoing work now, studying babies in two NICUs in Toronto and in Vancouver, all with different pain, strategy, pain management strategies. So I hope to have more to share in the years ahead. I know the team here is very interested in nutrition, so I just want to again show these data from the uh, beautiful Lausanne cohort. Looking at nutrition intake in the first two weeks of life, they carefully quantified the amount of nutrition the babies received. And you could see that the greater the energy intake, the better the brain volumes over time and with lipids. So energy intake and lipids just in the first two weeks of life, predicting brain volumes all the way out to term equivalent age. The early career researchers and I yesterday had an excellent talk of effect modification. And so we were interested in nutrition, but even more interested in whether nutrition might modify the relationship between neonatal adversity and brain growth. We know that being on a ventilator for a longer period of time is associated with slower growth of the brain. We could see that in the red line. These were babies with high ventilation needs but the babies with the same high ventilation needs who had more optimal nutrition just in the first two weeks of life, they attenuated that relationship. Their brain growth was normal. So another example, when we go back to our NICU to ask how do we use nutrition to promote this incredible trajectory of brain development, 
and promote recovery. So far, all of the data I've shown has focused on early in life to term equivalent age. I want us to now go longer, and then we're gonna go earlier. So this is the same baby brought back to the scanner eight years later. And uh, let me pause here to thank the families that have participated in these studies over very stressful periods of their lives over a very long time. We wouldn't have any of this understanding if it wasn't for them. But notice how the brain is transformed again. So now the brain is myelinated. So on this axial T2 image, the white matter is dark and the cerebral cortex is bright. Beautiful sulcations, gyrations, an amazing amount of brain growth over this time. And it would seem that the better your brain grows in the neonatal period, the better your brain is size-wise at the time you're at school age, at eight years of age. So the two best predictors of how your brain is growing over the long term is the rate of brain growth from early in life to term equivalent age and the presence of significant brain injury. So brain injury, you could still see these babies years later are having slower brain growth. Now I see some of you looking around the room wondering who has the bigger brain in your row, right? Not surprisingly, in normative populations, the size of your head doesn't really matter. It matters a lot in the face of early life adversity. And so you could see here that full-scale IQ at eight years of age is tightly related to the size of your brain in the presence of injury. You could look at this even more hopefully, that if we could grow the brain well, having significant brain injury doesn't matter. Your IQs are normal. In fact, some of them are even super normal. Let's go earlier. This is a beautiful study by Serena Council's group. Uh, the Zoom is cutting out the, um, the reference in biological psychiatry in 2020 with uh, diffusion tensor imaging that was very sophisticated to be able to follow looping structures. And what they showed is altered development of specific frontal limbic pathways in preterm neonates on diffusion tensor imaging correlated to maternal prenatal stress exposure. So not only do we have to work with our colleagues seeing these babies in the longer term, we also have to work closely with our maternal fetal medicine and obstetric colleagues to make sure we care not only for the fetus, but for the mom. So in the last few minutes, let's come to the omics. I've shown you a lot of data on the connectome. We all recognize the genome is important. We heard from our colleagues in Milan about the epigenome. I got to visit the metabolome and proteome facility here, and amazing the work that's happening here uh, in that core. But the most important ohm for child development is the home. We trained a dentist, uh, Dr. Noha Goma in neonatal neurology. She came to us because she was interested in social disparities in the brain. And it turns out that poor oral health is probably the single best predictor of preterm birth. And Noha would always joke with me that in order for scientists to take us seriously, we're gonna have to call it an omic. Right, genomics, epigenomics, proteomics, we need to call it homics. Let me convince you why. This is a, a classic American study by Hart and Risley. And if there's a way to lower the zoom so that people can have the reference if they'd like it, I first came across this study in the New York Times. They looked at a child's cumulative vocabulary at age three. I know many of you have children at home. The number of unique words a three-year-old has is an incredible predictor of how they do through school, the job they're gonna have, multiple aspects of their social well-being. Very hard to go and measure how many unique words a three-year-old has, but this team did it. And they saw that based on socioeconomic status defined on mom's profession, the high SES group, the child had 1,200 words. The middle SES group, just over 600, and the low SES group above 580. So as you go from the highest SES group to the middle SES group, you lose half of vocabulary. Again, how many of us are gonna come back to our clinic tomorrow and see children with conditions that can account for half of a vocabulary difference? 
we're starting to understand the neurobiology of these social disparities. This is, we saw some beautiful work presented earlier today. This is a different study by Kim Noble, who imaged uh, 1099 typically developing youth children, youth, and young adults in Los Angeles County. So lots of social, uh, lots of social um, spread. And she sees changes in the cerebral cortex and cortical folding and thickness related to the years of parental education, mom or dad. And if you look at where these changes are happening, they're predominant in language areas. And these look just like the maps we saw earlier of cortical change in the preterm baby. These aren't preterm, again, typically developing full-term just related to the years of parental education, quantitative changes in your brain morphology. We've known from many cohorts in Europe and North America that if you look at the outcome now of preterm babies, that there is a distribution related to socioeconomic status. This is work done together with Isabel Benevente Fernandez, now a, a, a neonatal neurologist in Cadiz, Spain. We see this uh, in this Vancouver cohort Again, just to remind us, uh, um, almost 240 preterm babies from Vancouver, 24 to 32 weeks gestation, so a high SES group. 60% of the moms had a college degree, 20% finished high school, 20% had a postgraduate degree. So we can see this shift to the right in the outcomes, full-scale IQ at four and a half years of age, in the moms that completed a postgraduate degree. Some difference, but less dramatic as you move to the lower SES group. Surprisingly, the same change for motor skills. But now let's take advantage of those maps of quantitative white matter injury and model instead, how does a, a given amount of white matter injury predict outcomes? So for a given amount of white matter injury, you see that in the middle and the lower SES group, white matter injury does what you would expect. It predicts lower IQ scores. It predicts lower motor outcomes. What happens in the highest SES group? White matter injury doesn't matter. In fact, the children on average with significant white matter injury in the highest SES group do better than their peers without white matter injury. I don't know about uh, what happens in Italy, but when we start a study I'd ask who's most likely to volunteer for the study and are they the ones most likely to benefit from the findings? So I have two more minutes left in the 45 minutes that I have. So let me give you just two more quick studies. One to bring us back. Um, this is for the team in Milan about uh, epigenetics. So we used whole methylomassays to look at calculated baby's epigenetic age. This was work done again with Noma, Noha Goma and Mike Kobor and his team to look at the epigenetic clock of preterm babies. And what we see is that extreme preterm birth is associated with a significant difference in epigenetic age. Their epigenetic age is higher than predicted. And you can see that that difference, if you could see the axis, you would believe me, but the greater this age difference between your chronologic age and your epigenetic age, the worse your brain grows. I'm an optimist, so I wanna just end on a high note. This is data from Jill Miller, who was, uh, had been a postdoc with Ruth Grunow and I, and is now faculty at the University of Calgary, looking at fractional anisotropy of the cerebral cortex and showing this important intersection between how a mother interacts with her child at the time of the Bailey scales at three years of age, as an opportunity with higher maternal sensitivity to promote better outcomes, despite the changes in the brain. So it's not just about what happens in the neonatal intensive care unit, it's what happens at the home. So I hope to have convinced you as we move into this era of the importance of the everyday for the brain health and long-term outcomes of preterm babies that we're gonna need to look to the connectome and also to the home. And boy, do we have so many important opportunities to promote better outcomes for these children if we take that wider and longer lens. It's not gonna happen in isolation. This is work that requires neurologists, neonatologists, maternal fetal medicine specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, many others. And I'm